Okay, welcome everyone uh, to this first seminar in our series Measuring Multidimensional Poverty from Many Angles. Um, this is a continuation of our joint seminar series, which is hosted with the Human Development Report Office at the United Nations Development Program, um, IAP at George Washington University, and uh, OFI here uh, in Oxford. Uh, Great to see some people here in person again uh, after a long time of, of virtual seminars. Um, and a big thank you, since this is our first seminar, also to all the teams that have been working to make this series possible, uh, especially Kellyanne and Tarania here in Oxford and uh, Kyle and Natalie and team um, in Washington. Um, we're going to have weekly seminars in Oxford here in, in this very room. Uh, if there's anyone online who's also in Oxford, please. You're very welcome to join us here. We have Indian snacks to bribe you to <laughs> us and pay attention to our presentations. Uh, and those who have found their way uh, online will have seen that you can also register for uh, all the subsequent seminars uh, using this the very same link. Um, the series tries to bring together academics, but also international agencies and, and policy practitioners um, to present and discuss innovations around multidimensional poverty measurement analysis and applications from many angles and also various uh, contexts, as we'll see. Um, we are very privileged to uh, hear the premier presentation of uh, a paper by uh, some colleagues uh, of ours uh, here at the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. We'll have our director, Sabina Alkaya, as well as Riso and, and Alexandra and, and Frank is online um, presenting a paper on an environmentally augmented multidimensional poverty index in, in Madagascar. And because we uh, are very selfish, we also, also always invite a discussant who reads the paper in advance and then can provide us with some uh, more detailed insights. And we're delighted that uh, Dr. Han Wong, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Brevetnik School here in Oxford, has agreed to, to join us for this today. So thanks uh, for agreeing to be discussant, Han, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you later. Uh, just a bit more housekeeping before we get started. The event is being recorded, so anything that anyone here in the room uh, is saying uh, will be on record and also anything that uh, and, uh, we will speak up online uh, say will be recorded. Uh, here in the room in particular, we only have one microphone, so please be aware of whatever you say, even if you whisper somewhere there in the back, this microphone will pick it up. Um, so if you do not want everyone to hear your whispers, maybe just uh, avoid them till after the, after the seminar. Um, we'll have 35 to 40 minutes presentation um, by our um, colleagues and then uh, Han will take over with a few discussant remarks that will also initiate a Q&A. Um, and after that, we, we should have some time for some hopefully interactive discussions with people here in the room, of course, uh, online audience. So you'll see there's a, a Q&A function, also a raise your hand function on, on Zoom, which the online audience can use uh, to please um, yeah, shoot any questions that you might have uh, our way. Um, with that, I think we can get going. And Teresa, Sabina, and Frank are going to uh, kick off, followed by Hannah. Well, thank you very much. And thank you especially to Jacob, um, who also has played a leading role in um, organizing these seminars. Um, this is joint work, as he said, with Kenito um, and Gernantana, with Alex Fortage and with Frank Bulmer. And Alexandra has also been coordinating the Global MPI, which we will launch on the 17th when there is this next seminar next week. And so she had an overlapping meeting, um, which is uh, not any with us, but next time she very much will be. Um, this paper tries to extend the global multidimensional poverty index for Madagascar by adding a fourth dimension of environmental indicators and compares trends of that environmentally augmented MPI with the global MPI over a decade. We chose Madagascar because it has high poverty levels in the global MPI, it has high environmental stresses, and its environmental diversity underpins people's lives and livelihoods. So it's a place where it's vital to reconcile development and ecological sustainability. And Harry uh, did his doctorate um, on both topics here in the university, and so is also an in-house expert. We use the global MPI to assess poverty. And that is constructed from two demographic and health surveys in 2008 and the multiple indicator cluster survey in 2018. And we used it because it's internationally comparable, available for Madagascar with that disaggregation. 
We then merged the global MPI geospatially with five environmental indicators. And Harry is going to go through all of the techniques done that, that were used. Um, as Frank and others will elaborate, this study is constrained by data. We wanted to look at other environmental deprivations. We could not. And it's also constrained because some of the standards we might wish, for example, deprivation cutoffs, are present for human indicators, like what is under nutrition or what is adequate sanitation, but not present in the same way for people um, experiencing different types of environmental degradations. And so this is a first stab. I'm sure it will be improved. The literature is very extensive, and the paper extensively refers to it. Um, but here are a couple uh, points of intersection. One is Amartya Sen's capability approach. There are many conceptual um, and different approaches to viewing the interlinkages between environment and human development, but we are going to be building on that approach. Um, there's also qualitative and participatory analyses that are so important because they document at a human level the inextricable links between poor people and their environments, not only in instrumental terms of livelihoods, but also intrinsic terms of beauty and of sacredness. Um, there's a literature very, very active on geospatial merging of different data sets and joint an analysis of different kinds of indicators um, and social indicators, poverty indicators in the environment. And there's predictive analysis, basically of what are the communities that will be most affected by climate crises as these eventuate in different scenarios. And of course, the need to adapt for adaptation, um, given that the poor and marginalized communities are more likely to be disproportionately affected by climate policies. This paper contributes primarily to the geospatial merging uh, and joint analysis. So in terms of the concepts, very lightly, um, just to locate this in the capability approach, um, it's looking at environmental indicators that affect intrinsically valued capabilities. And they also may be instrumental to other aspects of, of life. And we're going to be focused on those environmental indicators that are feasible, but that somehow proxy environmental related, poverty related environmental capabilities. Um, and so we want to look at both an intrinsic aspect, like endangering life, requiring emergency responses, or uh, defect, directly affecting intrinsic um, valued resources, as well as, of course, the instrumental. Um, and we are, as usual in our work on multidimensional poverty, looking at the overlap at the level of the household, though as colleagues will explain, actually here it's also at the level of the cluster, but looking at people who experience different deprivations, human, human poverty related and environmental related at the same time. So the structure is a familiar global multidimensional poverty index that we will present in more detail next week. But just to run you through it, there are some indicators and each indicator has a deprivation cutoff. For example, um, you are deprived if any member of your household is undernourished. So we define undernutrition, or if you don't have adequate sanitation, we define what that is, what source of water. If you don't have electricity, it's easy. Um, if you don't have at least anybody in the household with six years of schooling. So when we talk about deprivation cutoff, that's a standard for each indicator. And each person is identified as deprived or non-deprived in each indicator. You sum up weighted score of the deprivations they do experience, and you identify them as poor if that deprivation score is at least the level of a poverty, poverty cutoff for the global MPI one third. And you compute a measure beyond that. It's a thumbnail, but next week we'll have more. So very briefly, in terms of Madagascar and the global MPI, over a decade, the harmonized MPI reduced from 0.433 to 0.372. The incidence reduced from 76 to 67 percent. The number of poor people increased by 2 million due to population growth. Um, and just under half of the subnational regions had a statistically significant decrease in poverty. As you can see visually, it's quite a poor place, as I mentioned earlier. So the question is, in this environment so overlaid with biodiversity and also with different kinds of risks, what happens if we bring into view the environmental deprivations? Um, over to you, 
Um, Harry. So my name is Harry. Harry is one in Andrasana. Feel free to call me Harry. Um, as Sabina said, I did my, my uh, TFIL here on biodiversity conservation at the Department of Biology. Uh, and I'm a research fellow at Warwick, Warwick University, and uh, also a member of the office team in this project. So my, my role today is to, you know, to tell you uh, briefly about how did we incorporate the environmental data into the uh, measurements of uh, EMPI. So uh, I will go through the, the, the uh, seven steps I am showing on the screen from locating the clusters until compiling the value so that the data is ready for analysis. And I apologize for my strong accent. I, I hope you understand me. Uh, so uh, when I say locating the clusters, um, we need to understand the geographical location of each cluster and also the uh, administrative location of each cluster. So that means uh, which region, we have 22 regions in Madagascar, which district, we have 119 districts, which commune, we have 1,600 communes and in which village, Fukutani, we have 16,000 Fukutani. So we have to have a detail of information for locating each cluster. We don't have the geogra ge geographical coordinates for households. However, what is available is the geographical co coordinate for the clusters. So in each cluster, we would have minimum 30 households. And we assume in this study that all the households within a cluster would have the same environmental conditions. So here, you can see that in the DHS 2008 program, we had 600 uh, clusters, sorry. Oh, 600 clusters. And in the mix 2018, we had 800 clusters and that gives us a total of 1,400 clusters and they are distributed across the country as uh, shown in the map. And the next step is to choose the environmental indicators. I will not spend very much time on this slide as my colleagues will, uh, will talk more about it, but we, we spent quite a lot of time in, in, you know, in choosing which variables to consider. We spent a lot of time in working on precipitations, uh, data, analyzing the monthly and daily precipitations and same for temperatures. Uh, however, at the end, we decided to, take, to, you know, to keep these five indicators, air quality, cyclones, uh, forest cover, uh, fire, and earthquakes. So I will uh, show you, uh, uh, you know, how we did with this data. We checked the availability of them first, and they are free of charge. Most of them, some of them we need to pay, but we want to be used, they are free of charge. So everyone can download them and can get them for free. Uh, for example, for forest, we use the Hansen uh, global uh, forest data, which is 30 meters uh, resolution, but is available everywhere in the world. For air quality, we use the the NASA uh, data, one kilometer resolution. Uh, for, for cyclone, we use the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric, Atmospheric Administration uh, from, from US the data from, from low, low AI, uh, 10 kilometer resolution. Um, and for earthquake, uh, there is a robust uh, archive of earthquakes from the USGS uh, uh, website. Uh, one kilometer resolution. And for fire, there is a very robust data from the University of Maryland and from Modis, um, you know, available for everyone for free as well at one kilometer resolution. So we don't know this data. Some of them are, you know, some of them are rasters. Some of them are vector formats. Uh, format. Some of them have to be you know, they were in Excel, but you know, our role was to convert them into shape files to be able to visualize them in ArcGIS. So this is showing, for example, the cyclone data, it looks like this. So our role was to locate where is Madagascar to clip the data 
and then to extract information from, from this. Uh, so, so this is during the last 50 years or so, and this is for 2008. And uh, this is uh, what is the data and it is the same print, you know, it is available for the whole world. And we have to clip, uh, you know, the existing data for uh, Madagascar. The next step was to determine the range. So the range of the uh, environmental indicator. Uh, I will not uh, spend very much time on it, but I think it, it, it is better to, to, it could to point out that, for example, for, 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 for forest, there is no clear policy uh, about which forest is enough for a household. There is no clear policy telling us what is enough in terms of forest. So we have to, to, to read international conventions and we have to, to, to discuss with, with people uh, because I'm from Madagascar and I was in Madagascar when we ran most of these analysis, uh, talking with people and for example, this 10 kilometer radius here uh, means that local people they would be happy to work for two, for, for two hours to find firewood and to find wood for building houses and for wood for construction. And so, so we, some of the decisions we made are, are, are sort of uh, arbitrary, but however, they are based on, some, on, on local uh, investigations and also on, on reading of papers and uh, conventions. Uh, so uh, for determining the range, uh, now we need to, to think about the space. For example, if, if this is the cluster, these red dots here, these are the clusters, how we will understand the, the available forest cover around each cluster and what is our role to, 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 to determine uh, that range. And, and for example, if your if, if, if your household is located in a place like this, you, you would struggle to find the, you know, the fuel, the, the firewood for cooking your food, and there is no food available. It, it, no forest means no food, no uh, wild yam, no, no food, no medicinal plants, and so that has a strong effect on people's well being. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the next step is to choose the special. Uh, extraction method, and there are many methods for extracting the data, but what we decided to use is probably the best one, is the buffer zones. So th these are the buffer zones, so around each cluster, we decided to, to draw a, a cycle, uh, 10 cycles, like 10 rings, uh, every five kilometers, so from five kilometers until 50 kilometers, and that gives us the maximum possibility to choose which one is more associated with the changes in environmental indicators and which one is most appropriate. Uh, and that is, for example, here, this map is showing the, the earthquakes. So we can see, we can count how many earthquakes happened within each uh, circle. For cyclones, this is cyclone data. We can count how many cyclones passed through uh, each uh, uh, circle. And for fire, which is a point data, we can count how many fire alone, how many uh, active fires uh, have been detected within uh, each circle. And then, as long as, uh, as soon as that method is, uh, is determined, uh, we need to tell the computer how uh, to, 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 to draw the polygons. And so we need to, we, 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 we wrote Python uh, batch file to, you know, in order to run Python commands in ArcGIS using the geoprocessing uh, tool to tell the computer to tell ArcGIS draw 10 circles around each cluster. And then we get something like this. So around each of the cluster, we have 10 circles. So that means we have 14,000 buffer zones. And, and it is a hard work to extract the environmental information for every single uh, cluster. And it takes time. Even if your computer is powerful, it is still takes quite a lot of time, especially if the environmental data comes as a raster. Raster is very heavy. Uh, and the, the next uh, uh, step is to extract the information. 
So grouping the, poly the polygons first and then extracting from each of the uh, uh, circle and another another pattern uh, was ready uh, around for the geo processing. Uh, and then the, the last uh, bit of it is to uh, uh, is to write a VBA macro in Excel around the VBA to put every single CSV file together to get to the for this, which is ready for MPI uh, analysis. And then my, my colleague, uh, Frank, will tell you more about how to uh, how to analyze you know, the, the MPI. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Harry and uh, Sabina. Um, yes, I'd like to pick up on the points that uh, Harry mentioned with regards to the indicators uh, in the environmental dimension that we eventually chose. Um, the first step we did was basically to look at, a, to do a data inventory. Um, Recall that the global MPI was designed in 2010 against the um, MDGs and updated in 2018 with regards to the SDGs. So this seemed to be a reasonable first uh, way to look at it uh, and to identify potential indicators. So as Harry was already highlighting, um, outdoor air quality uh, is certainly considered uh, with, with overlinks to SDGs targets 3, 7 and 11. Um, there are storms, fires, earthquakes, forest cover or forest cover loss. Uh, soil erosion, um, which is also very, uh, very f f frequently uh, mentioned in the SDGs. Precipitation, um, which has obviously um, uh, linkages to droughts and floods. Uh, temperatures and uh, clearly biodiversity loss, uh, both underwater and with life on land. Now, the next step obviously with an MPI is always to identify deprivation cutoffs by indicator. And uh, Sabina already mentioned that this has been um, a new way of looking at for us who are working as this is experimental. So we needed to identify um, crucial cutoffs that would uh, separate uh, a critical mass of, of, let's say, deprivation that then classifies a household within a cluster as deprived. So this was more feasible with certain indicators than others. So when we're speaking about air quality, storms, fire, and earthquakes, um, they were we were able to choose uh, what we believe to be reasonable first deprivation cutoffs because we could adopt, for instance, international standards, which is normally the best. Um, so on air quality, this has been set by the WHO in 2021. Um, the annual uh, average concentration of fine particular matter should not exceed five micrograms per cubic meter air. So this is a clear uh, level by which uh, your human welfare, um, which we're interested in most, uh, will suffer. Others, you can also look at tropical storms and measure them, obviously, in, in their intensity and in knots and kilometers per hour, and then say, okay, it has reached a, a critical mass. And for us, the, 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 the point here was to decide whether we already take or also take um, tropi tropical depressions as a uh, as, as, as sufficient to call it a deprivation. In situations where you don't have, when you don't have these clear guidelines, um, there's still the option to apply um, empirical trials and, and normative reasoning. And this is what we've done. We've, we ran in some six trial measures where we tried different, where we looked at, for instance, number of recorded fires, um, looked at the, at the literature, for instance, prevalence of slash and burn, which in Madagascar is still uh, very frequent, and then is, uh, tried to find a reasonable cutoff that is defendable, which in our case, we set at three. Next slide, please. Now with others, um, and here, as already been touched upon by Harry, uh, forest cover loss, soil erosion, precipitation, temperature, and biodiversity loss, um, we ran into uh, greater challenges. Um, so there is less international standards, particularly with forest cover loss and soil erosion, where you would say this is now a point where uh, human uh, welfare is clearly um, is clearly threatened. Um, for instance, um, it is although it's clear that uh, deforestation is harder to measure than forest degradation, as far as the reading goes, it has been monitored at the national level, for instance, at, at the Madagascar uh, level, and this is not happening uh, in Madagascar. So we were not able to detect uh, an international uh, an international international standard there. Uh, same with soil erosion. We could have we could have measured it, we could have computed it, but it was not clear where to set the cutoff. With others, and, and Sabina mentioned that um, we have 
what we looked at mostly direct links uh, to human welfare, but they're also clearly indirect links. Um, so for instance, with regards to precipitation and temperature, um, the direct point uh, of entry is to look at floodings or life-threatening heat waves like we've seen um, earlier this year in India, uh, where temperature exceeds, for instance, 50 degrees or something. And this is clearly th life-threatening. But we also see, obviously, those uh, indirect links to uh, food security, the instrumental value, so to say, where at, at certain, certain moments of the year, um, for instance, below normal rainfall during the cropping season is worse, um, as well as higher than average temperature during the harvest season. Those are the crucial moments um, in the in the season, the calendar, uh, where you need to uh, take a look at. Um, that being said, giving uh, giving those considerations um, exactly, our households in a cluster, and this already has been mentioned by Harry, uh, are deprived if forest cover is less than ten percent in a 10K radius um, with regards to air quality, annual concentration of fine particulate matter is higher than five micrograms per cubic meter air, also within a 10K radius. A cyclone was recorded within a 50K radius. Obviously with cyclones, we have a greater radius used um, and uh, opted to also include tropical de uh, depressions and tropical cyclones. Um, with fires, uh, three or more fires uh, were recorded um, within the within the 10k radius, and an earthquake uh, of a magnitude of four or more was recorded as well in the 10k radius. Um, now we are aware of uh, uh, several discussion points coming up to us, and I think that's already one question coming up in the Q and A. Um, there. Are, Clearly, a lot of exposure to environmental deprivations are often a form of covariate shocks, uh, earthquakes, cyclones. Um, and we're aware that often with regard at the household level, the way households cope with those types of shocks is equally crucial. Um, if you, for instance, um, earthquake proof your house or you have certain financial buffers, it clearly is important um, also against the literature. Um, we're operating with satellite imagery and um, giving that the global MPI and in general, MPIs are using um, are more frequently used to guide policy. Um, how how well is it? Um, so the assumption that all uh, households within the cluster um, are equally classified as deprived if if this occurs is this a just assumption? Um, on cluster radiuses, um, it was uh, technically uh, explained. We had five k, ten k, fifteen k, and so forth. And currently, we uh, we used mostly ten k except for the cyclones. Um, to minimize, I guess, the, um, the effect uh, to, to really say, okay, within a cluster, everybody is deprived. So if you have a larger cluster, you would have more households being deprived. Although this is an empirical question and uh, greater guidance in the literature, if there is some, some knowledge of the person in the room or online, is, uh, is very well uh, welcomed. We also acknowledge that some decorations are clearly more frequent and more frequently measured than others. Um, fire and air quality is much more frequent than uh, measured than earthquake cyclones. Um, that that clearly uh, is something we will see later also in the results section that has an implication also for policy. And we're unable as of now uh, to, to measure the severity uh, with some of the indicators, for instance, on fire. We're not measuring the severity there. It's just basically three fires recorded in the area. And next slide, please. Um, we're also aware, and I think that this is, uh, has come up with other indicators in the global MPI, for instance, assets, that there are uh, environmental de degradation and ex ex exposure might differ by region or rural urban areas. So um, poor air quality might be more recorded, more frequently recorded in urban as an urban deprivation. Um, cyclones hit coastal areas first often. Fires are strongly occurring in rural populations, forest fires, for example. So the question we faced was, um, should indicators be uh, differ, for instance? Um, again, temperature and precipitation, uh, absolute terms, how could this be measured? Um, and in all of this, and this is a technical point, um, missing values is clearly a challenge for any measure, but this in particular, because if you have a missing value on some of the environmental uh, indicators, you would drop quite a number of households. Uh, and that can clearly uh, have implications on your, on your results. Uh, and we faced also the option to uh, possibly, we have augmented the measure now by five indicators. If you use more, if you're not, 
if it wouldn't make more sense to maybe combine them as, for instance, in the assets indicator where you say, okay, you have eight, nine uh, exposure to deprivations and you're deprived if you're exposed to one or two. Um, but ultimately um, that, that leads us to the big, big three questions, whether or not it is, uh, should we merge rather at the household than the cluster level? Um, should environmental indicators vary, for example, by, by location or by occupation? Um, and obviously as highlighted by Sabina, participatory work uh, with the MPI is crucial to really assess um, if the poor people have the same understanding as, as we are right now uh, put forward. Um, but this, these are the concerns that we are highlighting in the paper that are empirical, but also um, certainly um, kind of normative. One point that we also always look at is, um, okay, you, 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 you come up with your choice of, for instance, uh, you know, the deprivation cutoffs, the poverty cutoffs, which in our case is equivalent to one dimension. So we have uh, your multidimensional uh, pool in the EMPI if you're deprived in the equivalent of one dimension. Um, so what we have done here now in this first test, and, and we, we haven't put it in the paper yet, but uh, we will, um, is, to, uh, is to plot um, across several, uh, across subnational regions of which there are 22 uh, in Madagascar, the MPI value in both uh, years, 2008 and 2018. And it's a very simple uh, visualization in the sense that if these curves would cross quite a bit, you know that the, uh, that the rankings are, are not as robust as you would hope for. Uh, and by the, by, the, by the simple look of it, we can see that as our cutoff is 25, um, there, there seems to be a certain level of robustness that we need to explore, however further. But it gives us the first sense of confidence in our uh, initial uh, results presented here. Next slide, please. Yes, and this brings us now to the question of, uh, of the results. Um, so in this table, you see the national uncensored and censored, censored headcount ratios, both by the global MPI and the EMPI. And I'd like to focus now a little bit on the new indicators. Um, so the, uh, the, just a reminder, the, the, the uncensored headcount ratios are basically the, the, the percentage of the, the of deprivation within an indicator, whereas the censored headcount ratio is, um, is, is, is the deprivations among those who are classified as poor. And uh, one first interesting observation is that FIRE shows the highest uncensored and censored headcount ratios of all the new indicators. Um, for instance, fire in 2008 in the uncensored was 72%, uh, 76% in the 2018. On the other hand, earthquakes are very low, so less than 1%, um, giving us a little bit of uh, food for thought to, to, to reflect on uh, whether or not to uh, adjust the deprivation uh, cutoff, or it might be that it's just in the sense of Madagascar, uh, a, reasonable, um, a reasonable result. We also see that uh, forest and air quality both have de uh, deteriorated. So uh, deprivation of, uh, in forest was 36% in 2008, and this increased to 65% in 2018 in the uncensored, um, as well as air quality has uh, risen quite sharply from 1% to 18%. So that is standing next to cyclones that have basically improved in terms of the uncensored and censored from 37% to 22%. Now, this is obviously a covariate shock. So um, we have caught this in the year of 2018. This is a good reminder that it might be different the next year. Um, and finally, um, I guess that for forest air quality and fire, there is quite a bit of difference between the uncensored and censored. And that means basically that a lot of non-poor households um, are also facing these type of, of deprivations, which maybe is not as uh, surprising given that we are measuring at the cluster level. Um, and I think with this, I pass back to Sabina, who will speak about uh, the redundancy test and further, further, further results. Uh, in the paper, this is basically uh, the maps that show us that uh, air quality and forest cover loss is deteriorating and the fires are increasing, where the darker colors uh, with regards to uh, air quality and fire are clearly worse. Uh, whereas lighter colors in the, in the forest cover map show that we see deforest or forest degradation, I would rather say, maybe at this point. But this is exactly what we saw on the table, but we can also visualize it um, with, the, with the environmental data. Thank you. Now I'll pass back. Yeah. So we're running short of time, so I'll tell you what the slide is about, but not go into details. This is a slide looking at the redundancy. So the percentage of people who live in households that are deprived by a pair of indicators as opposed to the percentage that could be deprived 
in that pair of indicators. And the basic story is that these new indicators, the five new indicators um, of the environment are not redundant. They're not saying the same thing. They're not at identifying exactly the same households as deprived. And they're also not completely overlapping with the MPI indicators. So it's a test to give us comfort that we're adding new information. We're not replicating redundant information. Um, so a question is, how does the environmental NPI, which has four dimensions and 15 indicators, different from the global MPI that I showed earlier? So these are the reductions, as I mentioned, for the global, and these are for the environment. It identifies more people as poor, 85%. It went down less, only to 81.4%. The absolute and the relative reductions of MPI intensity and incidence are lower for the environment MPI. Um, because it's higher, it is clearly making visible some environmental deprivations that poor people are experiencing, but that are not captured. And that's the case both for the incidence, but also for the intensity. So if we equivalize the intensities it's also higher in the environmental MPI. That being said, the geography of poverty um, between the MPI and the EMPI only changes marginally. Um, and many of the poorest um, regions by the GMPI, nine of the 10, are also among the 10 poorest by the environmental MPI, but the ranks change. So as Frank said, there's been an increase in deprivations in forest loss and an increase in deprivations in air quality. But the deprivations in cyclone went down. And those in forest, um, so how does that matter? So there are three dimensions of the global MPI plus environment. So the environmental MPI could um, contribute more than its weight of one quarter or less to the global MPI when it's environmentally augmented. And here we have that in 2008-9, it contributed 16% to the MPI value, and that went up to nigh 20% in 2018. So actually the contribution of environmental deprivations increased as poverty went down, making visible the fact that the poor people were being affected by additional environmental de deprivations. And that's really the value added of the study bringing that into view, that these contrasting um, directions. Um, and then how did that happen subnationally? So in rural areas, MPI went down statistically significantly, though not hugely. Um, it, the headcount fell from 91.7% to 89.2%, so not that much, two and a half percentage points. But in urban areas, it increased. So the headcount in rate increased over 10 percentage points from 44 to 54.9. Um, and so we'll look a little bit into that. So the environmental indicators of the rural areas increased between the two time periods, but they increased more in urban areas. And that's due to a higher increase in forest loss, a higher increase in fires, which we might not have expected in urban areas. And those are the big differences. And cyclones actually decreased more in urban areas in that decade. And in terms of the environmental MPI, this is the ranking of the regions from those that reduced poverty the fastest to those that reproduced the poverty the slowest. So a question is, is it a good news story? Are the poorest reducing poverty the fastest? And you see here, the red is the poorest in 2008 or 18. And so Android here um, is the poorest region. And it had statistically significant reduction, but not that fast. If you look at the other poorest regions, they did not have any statistically significant reduction. And only these regions had reduction and not others. If we compare the reduction in the environmental MPI, which as we know was slower than the global MPI, with the reduction in the global MPI, we see many additional regions had statistically significant progress. But we see also that in the case of the global MPI, 
the progress overall was not pro poorest. So in neither case is nobody leaving, being left behind. The poorest regions are definitely um, being further left behind. Um, and finally, um, if we look across all of the indicators of the environmental MPI for these, and they're in the same order from the fastest reduction to the slowest, we see the global MPI indicators, green means it reduced faster, right? Um, there's a little increase that's orange and the rest basically reduce. But if you look at the five environmental indicators, you see more patchiness. You see the red, the increase in forest loss. You see the green, the decrease in cyclones, but the red for air quality, particularly in urban areas, and a, a patch both ways for fires. And so that's saying again that the patterns subnationally among these environmental indicators are not matching uh, with each other. So those are at a rapid pace, some of the findings. The question beyond measurement is um, what other avenues of analysis should we do in this paper? There are many, many more that could be done in, in going forward. One is to do technical analyses of the maps and the overlays of the indicators. Also to analyze a set of EMPIs with all of the buffer zones that Harry constructed, not just 10 or 50 kilometers. Seeking to disaggregate the MPI by climactic zones or data permitting by predominant occupations would be interesting. And then of course, it's possible to simulate um, increases in the environmental indicators and to do the policy analysis, the regression analysis of trends in EMPI, climate policies, uh, growth, et cetera. So there are many different avenues that we could take this work forward. But I think the big question for us was what Frank raised, the question of the indicators. So I'll leave it there with great thanks to all of you and thanks to all my co-authors. Um, Thank you, Sabina, Harry, Frank. Um, and we are now handing over to Han for discussion remarks and then have time for questions both here in the room and also online. So Han, over to you. Yeah, so many thanks for having me to discuss this environmental MP project. So this is very interesting and important piece of work, both in terms of the climate change and the poverty reduction. So increasing researchers and columnists, so now pay very a lot of attention to the environmental issues. So however, you know, in the most of the case, so I found this paper tend to treat environmental factors as the reasons all the results of the poverty and also six um, the causal relationship between the environmental and the poverty indicators. So I think this paper shifted the perspective perspectives by considering the environmental as the part of the poverty. So my main comments on the paper is mainly focused on two parts. So the issue of the index construction and the geocode information of the sample. So firstly, the construction of the index, I guess during the presentation, some of the questions have been um, answered. So this part is perhaps the most uh, interesting part and maybe also very controversial when first reading it. So good environment can be captured through very uh, many dimensions. The currency also used uh, for forest cover, air quality and et cetera to measure it. So this may result to two problems. So firstly, it seem, seems that there are also very strong correlation between the index selected so far. For example, forest cover may lead to the boost in the probability of the wildfire. So in that case, uh, strength or the increase of the for one in the index can be the weakness or the reduce for the other. So that's a positive correlation between the index can may create a conflict in the final index composition. So the second part I'm not very sure is about excluding the flooding. So, you know, there are a lot of reports in the research. I'm sure that flood, flood is such a very important factor though for the environmental sustainability. So I, I know maybe there are some data issue or others, but um, the, one of the reason why I read the paper is say that the cyclone seems not, seems to be the most important reason, but if we want to make this clear, maybe we need to make kind of the correlation and show that it's indeed have a very strong correlation. So it will make the paper more convincing in that case. So in terms of the 
by the data, by the data. So I know that most of data have already distinguished the type of, type of the fire, like the straw burning or white fire. So such fire type information may be helpful to construct the index more comprehensively. So the other thing I'm not very sure is whether I'm not sure whether we can distinguish the size of the fire. So my guess is that since the satellite data can hardly distinguish the scale of the events at very precise level, so maybe we cannot get this information from the satellite, but possibly maybe when we check some news coverage, maybe, maybe we can get this data because the size of the uh, fire seems to be very important when we're considering the poverty within the country. So in terms of the geocoding information of the sample, so I have three main concerns. So firstly, the different sources of the geocoding information in the MICS and the DHS. So we know that in 2008, the data the paper uses MICS, and when it comes to 2018, we adopted the DHS. So the key thing is these two data may choose the sample very differently in terms of the ge geography. For example, MICS may choose the cluster or household in the northern part of the one province. However, the DHS may choose the household in the northern part of the province. So the result across the year might not be very comparable if they use the very different geographic location in that case. So the second question from my study is, does the result representative at the regional and the national level? So there is no question the result is very representative when we use the individual and household level data to measure the other kind of MPI. But the thing, but the thing is when we use the geographic information come from the cluster in front instead of the household. So maybe um, considering the cluster directly um, seems to be biased the overall results. So I don't know whether we can consider the weight in that case. So the final part is I just to show it in the map. So as the map in the slide show that many geocoded samples are around the sub-national boundaries. So the geocoding information is not very precise as we know. So even we making, um, even we make a 10 kilometer buffer of the points. So it's to may bias the result. So I think maybe we can do a kind of robustness check to exclude this um, points around the clusters around sub-national boundary to check whether the result is still the same. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Han. Uh, much food for thought for our presenters. Um, I'll allow them to, to answer to, to some of the points you raised perhaps also in a bit, but uh, in the interest of time, I think we'll try to combine that with uh, the Q&A session perhaps, and then whenever our presenters see fit, they can also uh, react to the excellent discussion remarks we've just heard. Um, so let's start with anyone here in the room, if there are any questions, um, clarification, comments, any kind of um, engagement is welcome. Half a hand here and half a hand there. <laughs> yes, please, Darin, and yourself. Uh, thank you. It's a really very important and, and uh, time, uh, uh, very time, timely, timely work. And uh, I think including the environment in the MPI really raises big issues regarding comparability. Um, the thing about you know, the drought and the floods, and I uh, think that the South of Madagascar has experienced the, uh, the, uh, the most severe drought. <laughs> Uh, ever, um, but then in five years' time, it might be experiencing the flooding, and, um, and so with the extreme in weather patterns, and uh, you know, how do we make this comparison over time? Because you know, ten years ago, the main issue might be too much water, and now it may be not enough water, and uh, um, and then you know, if you if you think about internationally. Uh, and having an environmentally MPI would be fantastic, <laughs> uh, but then. The issue of comparison is is really, I think, a big one. And uh, I think that's not what motivated the global NPI. You have your data sets, you can compare, you know, the education level in Madagascar with the one in, in Kenya. And uh, uh, but the, uh, the environment is very difficult. So, uh, so yeah, I think it's just yeah, raises a very existential question about the NPI. Uh, but yeah. Mm. Thanks. Other presenters happy to also have the second question and then answer those. Hi, uh, my name is Matai. I'm an MPLE student in Development Studies. Um, 
I think this research presents a fascinating perspective uh, on how MPI contribute to you know the, the emerging research in the context of Africa, for example. Um, my question somehow relate to what you're talking about. Um, what does this data tell us about the region, the Eastern African region, for example, uh, in terms of its use and the future research that comes from? I'm, I'm just interested to understand what yeah. the data really tells us in, in terms of the possibility of the MPI in relation to environment. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, thank you very much uh, to, to, to the questions from the audience and from Han. Uh, maybe starting with Han, I think um, that, that didn't really come up that much in our conversation that if you have greater forest cover, you uh, would see greater possibility of wildfires or fires. So I think this is definitely worth um, exploring uh, for our work. And uh, I think the point about uh, the flooding for the paper um, uh, is well made, and I think um, that is something we we need to work on to uh, for the paper. I, I think in our case, um, this and and I, I just refer not to the technical questions about some of the uh, the points that Harry is much better equipped to answer. But I think um, I think that yeah, flooding and drought. We need to work well on, in the paper on explaining um, our current our current omission of it. Um, because I do believe it indeed, like we will see more of those frequent uh, events. Um, and then how far this is, um, yeah, how far this is useful for uh, changes over time analysis or it might impede it. Um, I think at the moment we're experimenting in, in that sense. Uh, and, uh, and I think that these, these questions are also discussed among us. So for instance, if you have in one year, you have a cyclone and what are the policy implications for that versus in another year, you don't. So what is the message actually to policymakers? And I think, um, yeah, this is something that we're also uh, struggling a little bit with. Um, but I think this is, it really brings to th this, 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 this kind of sometimes erratic pattern is also sometimes useful to be seen in such an index reflected. So, um, yeah, so thanks for the for, for the useful uh, suggestions and yeah, for some of the uh, uh, ideas to reflect on. I guess I can I'll pick up with, with the kind of question of comparable, comparability. I think that that's a major question and issue that we face because even expanding into other countries would be an issue. Like where do we, what kind of environmental indicators, what kind of environment deprivation, deprivations are they facing? Can we actually, take what we've done with Madagascar and apply it to another country? Probably not. Um, and so this is a major issue. And, and I think there's you know, more to be explored, whether and if and how this is feasible. And, and also in terms of policy, like how can we address, at the moment we have cyclone occurrence, how can this can be addressed through policy is another question. So there are a lot of open questions and I, I would agree with that um, sort of. Yeah. And I think with, with just on a one note on, on drought, I think we've, we've tried really hard to include it, but we didn't manage in the end. I think that was, and it was an important issue for us to include it because of the situation going on in the south of, of Madagascar. And you might be able to say more, um, but we weren't in the end because we weren't, yeah. I think we were discussing also, I think Han mentioned the kind of correlation between the different um, indicators and we and like the different events and how whether one influences the other. Um, and we did discuss this and I think we sort of made a normative decision here to be like, but they are st standing independently, like experiencing a wildfire is, an, is, in, is, is sort of a different experience and affects a person differently than actually um, a cyclone. And I think that's why we ended up sort of um, using it as separate. And I would pass on to you and, and Harry, maybe to answer some of the other questions that I've missed so far. Um, oh, thanks, Alex. I, I think you can contribute a little bit. Um, yeah, the um, cited uh, the possible correlation between fire and uh, and forest. Yeah, we, we discussed about it, but uh, and we will rethink about it. Uh, the, the one thing I can say here is that you know, the forest cover in Madagascar is about 13%. So most of it will be grasses, you know. And when we talk about fire here, 
I understand that more this distinguishes the you know the wildfire and the anthropogenic fire. However, you know, I was a civil servant working for the Ministry of, of the Environment for, 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 for a few years. Um, when we talk about policy in Madagascar, we don't really have white fire. Every fire is anthropogenic. So people burning the, the, the savanna uh, for, for grazing or for slash and burn agriculture. So um, I strongly believe that even if there is possibly a correlation, I, I don't think it, it would be significant, but we will check. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is, uh, uh, you talked about the, the flood. We have the data about runoff. That is the quantity of water uh, every hectare, so kilogram of water every hectare per hour. And we have that as a time series data available. We, we could have used that. However, we decided not to use it because we, you know, we, we we thought about what you just said. And we, we also, we are still learning which one is more uh, appropriate for, for this analysis. So we will see maybe next time, um, we can incorporate some of those uh, down for blood data. The last point I wanted to make was, uh, you know, when Sabina mentioned the Anrui, which is one of the poorest uh, uh, regions in Madagascar, they make progress in terms of reducing poverty. Probably, I would say probably, because the government has received quite a lot of international funding, but goes but went to Anui for getting rid of funding because there is funding in, in Anui. So FAO and USF and UNDP, they spent quite a lot of money, and, and I believe more money than they spent before. And that is probably reflected. On the on the uh, MPI level, so uh, we, we can probably check, if possible, how much each region has received in terms of uh, international development support. Thank you. Um, just one quick thing on the comparability. I mean, when we wrote a conceptual paper, we talked ourselves out. We said there's it's impossible to get a comparable environment MPI, but the, the pressure of trying to look at it is is quite high, and so I think trying to do a good paper. On a national context is a first step. Um, it might be that we say, no, it's not possible, but it might be that we find some tendrils that are, and at least we'll learn. And so I think this paper is very much a learning ex experiment, but we don't have at this moment an idea to go global with it. Um, when we tried to do that a few years ago with the air particulate matter, um, there were just so many problems with rural, urban, with coping strategies, with the weights. Um, so these data exist, but but trying to bring them in is is problematic. So it seems better to go deeper uh, first. Okay, now um, we have two more people who'd like to uh, ask or, or say something. I think I'll first allow our co-host James Foster to uh, to contribute, and then Bishwa. I think we will allow you to uh, unmute in a minute. Uh, so if you want to, you can then just ask your questions and and give your comments directly. Otherwise, I'll read them out to our presenters uh, after we hear from James. Um, so James, first over to you and then uh, to give us a set of questions and comments. Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, great to be here with you all. Um, it's a really uh, wonderful chance to uh, be connected with colleagues in Oxford and with uh, colleagues in New York. Um, let me just ask my question. Um, you know, every variable we use in measuring poverty has kind of one aspect of getting to the actual situation a person is facing. Um, so that a deprivation really means something to that person. Uh, but at the, on the other hand, it also might be indicating a risk of something happening to the person which could be bad, but which hasn't happened. So there's an element of risk in almost all the variables. Some are less risk, more actual. Some are more risk, less actual. I wonder if you had uh, sort of thought through that aspect as you constructed this index. In particular, look at Cyclone. You know, I'm from Florida where we had hurricanes some years, two, three years, we'd have nothing. And the next year we'd have a, a super mega storm. 
Um, the problem is that understanding exactly how that leads to a deprivation or the lack of a deprivation, uh, that link is, is difficult for me sometimes as I interpret what, what you're trying to say in terms of um, in particular that variable, but other ones that are environmental. And I think it's a general issue. Uh, second, um, the main question uh, that comes out of MPI is always, well, what can we do about it? And um, apart from, you know, trying to get people to get on the bandwagon to do something about, let's say, climate change in some cases, um, uh, the question becomes, where does the policy relevance come in on a variable like cyclone or maybe some of the other ones that are a little bit uh, determination uh, that is not directly related in, to, to uh, what humans are doing at the moment. So on those two notes, uh, I look forward to your answers. Thank you, James. And uh, Bishwa, if you're able to unmute now, please go ahead and, and ask your questions. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Sabina and uh, team for this great work. It's really very challenging to include the environment related indicators of the four has been made since long. Uh, so, uh, two sorts of uh, questions. One is, uh, I think out of the five uh, environment related indicators, I see three are more related to disaster. And, uh, you know, unlike many other indicators, you know, it's, it's difficult to predict or uh, they do not change consistently over time. Uh, so, so, so in terms of comparability, I think, uh, what do we see? I mean, uh, isn't it, I think, better to include, I mean, indicators like uh, uh, carbon emission or air pollution, uh, water quality, or, um, you know, um, uh, uh, or um, uh, any other material uh, uh, foot, uh, footprint, uh, like when uh, we were measuring this uh, in related SDI, similar type of indicators can also be included here. That's my just only simple thought rather than uh, take into account the more disaster related indicators. That's one sort of, I think, uh, thought. The other one is, you know, at, uh, yes, it is already, I mean, known. Um, we are moving from uh, individual capability deprivation to household level capability deprivation. Now coming to um, uh, cluster level deprivation, assuming that uh, all the individuals are uh, more or less similarly affected uh, from this uh, environmental deprivation. So, so, so having said that, you know, I mean, I also see the merit of having separate analysis of environmental MPI. But uh, the point here is that uh, anyway, we are moving from individual to cluster level. Uh, since that, you know, we are making a strong assumptions here. Uh, so, thank you so much. But anyway, I much, much must appreciate. I think I'm sure this paper is going to contribute for the discussion and uh, help towards the measurement of environmental MPI, which is very much necessary. Uh, with the growing importance of the environment dimension in the development. Thank you. Thank you, Bishwa, and thank you, James, for those contributions. Um, back to the presenters for brief answers. Please. Can I a brief comment in terms of James? Thank you for your question. Um, so I think we we just so what we did definitely is discuss sort of the the indications of the in, um, indicators that we currently have. Uh, and how they then, you know, what kind of deprivations do they, um, I don't know what to look actually, <laughs> um, what deprivations they then actually um, result in, but we didn't yet make it as explicit in the paper. Um, and so this would probably be good to make it a bit more and also to think about it a bit more. Um, and I agree with your last point, point Bishwa, in terms of making a, a big jump from like individual to to kind of cluster, um, we kind of broke it down. But yeah, I think there there is a bit of a, a question of like what kind of data is there available where we can actually look at the household level or individual level. Um, so there was a big data constraint in that regard as well. No, just very brief. I think that uh, what Bishwa was saying is correct. We have right now a lot of uh, disaster data included in the in the EMPI. It, it just happened to be a little bit simpler at this stage, I would say. Whereas it's 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 uh, work that's um, that's ongoing, and I believe that 
a bit more granularity in the data would be indeed i i, I agree with this um, and we might need to go um, maybe other cases to look at what what is, what is feasible and doable and um, we need to make a big point about this in the paper about the assumption about that everybody in the cluster is indeed deprived because it's about people and um, and what james was saying so um, it is it is something i, I don't know we, we need to <laughs> we need to debate, uh, debate that really well in the paper i know thank you Thanks. Um, I think there are two things that actually also go back to Hans' points. One is that the aim in this paper, which may or may not be possible, but the aim was to look at deprivations that hit the same people in the same year as the poverty deprivations. So we're not looking at a risk. We're looking at something that actually addressed them. And Harry spent a lot of time working on data so that we could match the years because it wasn't easy. And the reason is that um, that is just a more natural way to go about using a, a, a multidimensional poverty measure than sub including risks in it when the probability that each risk would eventuate may basically have different probabilities for different population groups. So it's a much more complex indicator. I think that one feature that we haven't talked about is that the poverty cutoff identifies people as non-poor if that's the only deprivation that they have. So remember, in most indicators, nearly everybody who is hit by one of the five environmental deprivations was poor. And so they had enough, a critical mass of other indicators um, because they would have to be all deprived in all five environment indicators um, to be poor or in some mixture of those in poverty. So I think that that helps to separate out people who experience an earthquake but have an earthquake-proof house have coping mechanisms, the earthquake doesn't really affect them from others with, with other circumstances. So I think that that's important. And the last thing also for Hans' question about correlation, but also for James's question, is that when we look at redundancy, we are looking directly in this time for this household, do these indicators walk together? Um, and that's different from correlation, but it's in my mind a more precise indicator of the overlaps. And I think that that's useful um, to sort of stress test our assumption that each one is adding value. Um, and then for Bishwas, I think at the cluster level, we all just need to keep figuring it out. We have problems because if we could geolocate the households, people don't live in their house if it's not locked down. They go to their fields, they go to school, they go to work, they go to visit other family. And so even if we had it at the household level, it wouldn't capture people because we don't know where their fields and their places of work and their schools are. And so that's a problem. Uh, so anything that we do will be limited. Um, if we have a 10 kilometer radius and it's an urban area, then we're gonna capture everybody in the cluster anyway within the radius. So it doesn't matter household or, or others. And so I think we're learning how to do this, but we're also learning that some things don't matter as much as we thought they did if you have um, certain ways of preparing the environmental va variables. So I think it's it's very much a learning process, very much a work in progress. It would be lovely if you are interested online or here um, to be in touch because we'll be continuing to deepen this work um, and and any other input is, is welcome. And finally on disasters, Bishwa, we've been asked several times by the group that run the disaster risk reduction data sets to use their data sets because there's a lot of interest in the disasters community to know whether in fact, disasters are more common in poverty prone areas. And so they actually want that empirical piece of information. So it's a different community in a different setting than this one, but that's an example of an international data set with a group that want us to combine them. In a sense, to answer a question, at this moment, are the poor more likely to be victims of disasters than others? We don't know that. When we merge, we can figure that out. It might not be right, it might not capture everything, but it might at least push the frontier of knowledge forward. Fantastic. Uh, well, please let's give a warm round of applause to our presenters. And I want to continue fantastic discussion, Han, and uh, online presenter Frank, uh, and James and, and Bishma for your comments and questions. Um, thank you again to all co-hosts uh, who've made this possible and all the teams behind this. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. So same uh, Zoom uh, room and uh, same physical room here for a special session on the launch of the 
2020 Global Multidimensional Poverty Index Report, um, which is jointly published by our co-hosts and colleagues at HGO at UNDP and um, our colleagues and myself at OP. Um, next week will also be uh, something, especially for those who are new to the uh, world of multidimensional poverty measurements. So we'll also give a bit of an introduction to the global MPI um, and then also uh, virtually participate in the launch, um, which will be um, in New York next Monday. If you want to know more about our work or our colleagues, please visit our websites, IAP, HGO, OP, follow us on, on social media, and you'll be kept in the loop about proceedings and, and other events happening. That's it from us for this week. So we'll hope to see you back next week um, at, at 4 p.m. British time and whichever time in the in the world where our online audience is, is joining us from. Thank you.